Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for your patience with technology, not always my best friend, but uh, as Rob says, we're going to talk about the Brahma Viharas this morning and uh, the talk's going to be in four parts. I'm going to do a, a brief introduction with the Brahma Viharas so we all know we're all talking and thinking about the same thing. Then I'm going to talk about my personal experience with the Brahma Viharas. And then we're going to do a practice together and then I hope you're going to give me some feedback or questions and I can find out whether because yeah give me some feedback because I just love to know what uh, it's very much a personal exploration I'm doing so I'm very interested to in what other people think so I'm gonna get onto the slides and we'll go through those so the Brahma Faharas of the divine abidings are essentially four linked meditation practice which is just you can do all of them individually as well and I came across a nice thing that I'd forgotten yesterday when I was online. They're also called the four immeasurables. And that's rather lovely because there's two aspects of the immeasurableness, if there's such a word. There's the idea that uh, they have no limits. So if you, you think that I can't share my meta because then I won't have any. The reality is it is immeasurable. There is always going to be more and more meta. And the other thing I, that resonated with me was the idea that they, they are immeasurable. In my period of exploring this, I keep finding more and more about it. So there is just, it's a bottomless ocean resource as you practice this, I find. So the four divine abidings are meta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeka. Traditionally, Metta is translated as loving kindness, but I'm not fond of that. It has a sort of a sense of romance, sentimentality. Somebody almost said it was like, who well, as Sharon Salzberg was quoted as saying, that sometimes it feels like it's a Valentine's Day effect, and that's really not what they're trying to do. I much prefer to describe it as being universal friendliness. Because when I teach Meta to, to students, and they've got no experience of this whatsoever, I, and I say to them, well, think of you're about to meet a good friend. And think of the quality and the flavour that arises in you with the thought of being with your friend and share that, friend, that sense of friendliness with yourself. So I feel that universal friendliness is a better description. It's not unique to me, I've come across it in other writings, but it's what appeals to me. And I have a love, as you'll discover as I go through this, I have a love of words, and words have to mean something to me to be of value. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this basics. This is the four practices, you can do them all individually. Uh, but it's something really lovely about what we're going to do to do is we're going to look at the four of them linked together. Mudita is a good one to do, obviously, sympathetic joy or joy in the others. If somebody you know has had some particular good fortune and you don't feel they deserve it, it's quite useful to practice it to try and calm your mind a little bit. So I think this just sums it up. Metta embraces all beings. Karuna embraces all those who suffer. Mudita embraces the prosperous, the fortunate. Epeka embraces the good, the bad, the loved, the unloved, and the pleasant and unpleasant, which I think covers about everything. Traditionally, because the divine abidings are very much about the idea of connectivity that we are not that we are connected to all beings understandably we very much have a tribe a sense of tribalism we live in little communities of people like that we like or are like us but the reality is we all have the same basic wants, needs, you know, food, shelter, friendship, whatever. So we have this connectivity and by opening up to that, we open up to the world and world experience. 
So the important thing about meta is that we always start with ourselves. That's the basis of it. We then bring to mind a friend who is, as I described earlier, it's the person that make, makes us realize what friendship is and how to develop it towards ourselves. The neutral person is really the every man or every woman. It's that real sense of connectivity to everybody. And it's an act of generosity to actually give something to somebody you don't know in a quite a personal way. It's generosity in a lot of ways. The benefactor always confuses people in my class, and I don't know, and it's, it's worth just doing this. You know, there used to be a saying years ago that somebody was a self-made man, and the sort of joking response was, at least nobody else is to blame for a while. Um, but you know, we, are, we have all benefited over the years from people uh, who have just taught us something or taken some time with us and we've learned something. As I've got a huge number of people in the Samatha Sangha who have been benefactors to me. Some of them are teachers and some of them are just people I've been on courses who have just made that difference. So the benefactor is a very wide thing, but it's important. The thing about it is we don't always get an opportunity to say thank you to people who help us or even think to say thank you to afterwards when you realise just how they've helped us. And the difficult person, I love this, is describing as being the world. Uh, and really the world has lots of sharp edges and the difficult person helps us to develop that sense of being able to work in the world. Okay, so that just gives us a little insight into what we're going to be talking about. I'm not going to be going through the five groups of people today. We're just going to do this. It's just really going to be related to ourselves. So I want to talk about my early experiences of uh, coming across Meta, really Meta. Back in the late 80s in Cambridge, I took a notion to learn meditation. And I, as is nowadays, the only real place to go and learn meditation that was obviously available was what was then the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order in this now true right now. And they used to run a class and one week they'd teach you some sort of breathing meditation and next week they would teach you metta. And I, I love the words of metta. May, I be, may you be well and happy, free from sorrow, free from pain. But there was no way I could connect with these. I just cycled across Cambridge, having finished work and had my tea and sat, walked in, sat down, and practiced this meta towards the five people which is described. And I'd have to have a heart of stone not to want to wish them well and be free and happy, but there's no way I could make a connection with this. And, <sighs> It quickly became clear to me that that it was the chattering mind and the busy mind that was the problem. As in my experience, there's two types of people that you meet in meditation. There are people who can sit down, close their eyes, and start to breathe, and the mind goes quiet. And then there are the people like me who close their eyes start to breathe and the mind just goes berserk. So fortunately, shortly after this, I discovered Samatha, which allowed me to have a more structured practice, which allows, allowed me to get some degree of calm in the mind. And Samatha uh, in Cambridge, we came across Metta every so often. Um, but it wasn't done like the FWB, it wasn't every other week. So there's something that popped in and out. And I always loved the idea of 
wishing people well and not. I mean, it's a jolly nice thing to do. But um, it never seemed to work for me. So I managed to get the mind quiet, but it still wasn't working for me. Now, um, so when people, when the, the instruction for practicing metta is to breathe through the heart. Now I'm a scientist. If you ask me to breathe through the heart, it's that pimp, pink pumping thing in the left hand side of my chest. And breathing through there actually has no, it, it really doesn't work. And it's t it was only 10, 15 years ago that somebody actually explained to me that heart is actually in the center of your breast bone and you breathe through there. And it transformed my relationship with practice. It would be lovely to say that this was because I was on a retreat with Les Carlo on the Brahma Viharas, and I'm sure he did mention on it, but I think we all know that people tell you lots of things over the years. And there's a few of them you remember, and there's a few of them you, you have to be in the right place at the right time to remember, to actually embody them. So I say it'd be a nice story if it was that uh, practice week with Les Carlo and the Divine Abidings. But it was some point, or the point that somebody finally pointed out to me. And this just gives me time to make a little aside. When I teach my class meditation, I always tell them there are no stupid questions. There are only the questions that somebody else in the room wants to hear the answer to. And if only all those years ago I'd taken more advice and said, look, this is not working for me. Where the hell is the heart? Might have gone a lot better. So anyway, so I'd found the heart and I started to uh, have a sense of connecting with this practice. But I still wasn't really happy with this idea of the phrase, may, I, may you be well and happy, free from sorrow, free from pain. It'd be wonderful, but I never felt it was realistic. It's not the real world. So in this sort of same sequence, I came across a book uh, Sharon Salzberg's book on loving kindness, the revolutionary art of happiness. And uh, we'll go back and we'll share something. So the traditional phrase for uh, meta practice is, may I, you be well and happy, free from sorrow and free from pain. Well, speaking personally, I regard happiness as a peak experience. Um, sorrow is part of life. And as for being free from pain, I, at my age it doesn't happen, but I just try and get on with life in any case. So I love the fact that Sharon Salzberg and the other people have used it, came up with the phrases, may I be free from danger? May I have mental happiness, physical happiness? And the one I really love is, may I have ease of well-being? So I actually changed these again because I love words. And may I be free from fear? We all have fear, especially in this time of COVID-19. There is a sense of anxiety almost for a lot of us in just going out in the world. And imagine being out of this situation of COVID-19 and just not having that tension, just going into the, out into the world. As I say, I regard happiness as a peak experience. I'm much more looking for contentment. So we talk about me you have mental contentment, may you have physical contentment. It doesn't mean that you have to be perfectly mentally well. It doesn't mean you have to be perfectly physically well. It's a simple attainment that you can, with whatever difficulties you've got, you can still be content. 
And then the last one is may you have the ease of well-being. Which is just that beautiful idea of sort of being able to go with the flow. It really involves a sense of equanimity. So these are the phrases I was starting to use in this sort of thing. And I think it's really sort of important. So I'll just go back a bit. I've gone slightly out of sequence here. So I, in the latter part of my time in Cambridge, I was starting to explore the divine abidings and all the rest of them. There's lots of things that have come up. And it's interesting that all the time I was teaching the town class, I realized that the vast majority of the people who were coming into the class weren't coming to learn Buddhism. They were really just trying to find a sense of escape from the angst of their day-to-day -day life. And what they really wanted was something that could give them some quiet. And in amongst all that struggling with angst and anxiety and all the rest of it, they were, um, it wasn't, it, they were struggling with their self-worth, their self-esteem. So I made the decision when I started up the class in Norwich two, two and a bit years ago, that I would do meta with every pity from the door at the time that the first class they walked through the door. I wanted to teach them how to really connect with themselves again. And I wanted to teach them the basic parts of Samatha, the counting and the following to allow them to still the mind. Because that was the basic things that I'd learned over the years, that you need to have a quiet mind to be able to connect with it. And you need to have, as far as I'm concerned, actually words that resonate with you, that have a meaning for you, that are not some idealistic idea. And I was really very pleased with the group. They really, really took to practice in meta with me. And they got a huge amount out of it. And I started talking about them and I said to them, look, there's three other practices we can do. Do you want to have a look at these? And this is what I'm really going to be talking about this morning is the work that I've done with my beginners class in Norwich. And uh, this wouldn't have been possible without them, so I thank them. They have been my benefactors. So we're working with this thing now. As, as I said at the beginning, it's traditional to practice metta towards yourself. But interestingly, it's not traditional to practice compassion towards yourself. We practice compassion to pour somebody who's suffering or the good friend or the benefactor of the people on the list, but we don't practice compassion towards ourselves. And why don't we? So I came across this from this book called Loving Heart, Peaceful Mind, which is from a wonderful tradition, which is called Rational Buddhism. That's an interesting thought we could discuss for some time. And I suspect this comes from a, a, a Tibetan Mahayana tradition. And we can see that here they're practicing compassion towards themselves. And, you know, 
you know, it's the old age, sickness and death, but it's got a nice little bit in it. So if, I'll just read this through for you. I mean, you can read it yourself, but except in this body is subject to aging, I will abandon the ways I create more suffering so that I can enjoy the present moment. In the meantime, I can compassionately accept myself when I suffer. And the same thing for disease, for death. And then, which I think is a nice practice thing, they're saying accepting that circumstances will at times separate me from that which I love and enjoy. I will refrain from demanding life to be otherwise. And accepting that life will sometimes ask me to associate with people and circumstances that I don't like, I will refrain from demanding otherwise. So this is very clearly saying that when we are practicing compassion towards somebody who's suffering, we're suffering ourselves. And that's a basic tenet of Buddhism, really, that unless we have suffering, we don't. Suffering is our guide, our inspiration, whatever you want to call it, to practice in meditation and, and pointing our intention towards enlightenment. So I went back and I looked at compassion. And again, the traditional phrase is, may you be free from pain and sorrow. Well, I think I've already said, you know, sorrow is part of life. It comes and it goes largely, speaking personally, I go through it most of life without too much sorrow so far, drinks, cost and touch wood. But there is a sense of unsatisfactoriness to life. So I wanted to come up with something that was really helpful, that really could connect with what I wanted to wish with Karuna, with compassion. And Karuna is a large opening of the heart. And we have to be very careful when we're practicing compassion. That we that we actually are st standing with somebody. We're not trying to take on the pain and we don't try and take on more than we are physically capable of coping with. So we do this quite gingerly and quite slowly. And we recognize when we're becoming uncomfortable and we perhaps take a mental step or two back. And maybe next time we'll be able to go forward a little bit but we do it tentatively and we treat ourselves with a sense of compassion while protecting ourselves. So I came up with this form of words, which I think conveys what I want to talk about compassion. And you know, you say, may you be able to be with your suffering. First step is actually to realize sometimes that you're suffering. And when you realize that you're suffering, you know, you, it gives you the, the a sense of being to know. And you want that person who realizes that they're suffering to be able to reach out for support and aid. So you're giving us sort of affirmative message. But you also want them to not be engulfed by that suffering. May you have the strength and insight not to allow your suffering to define you. There's a lot of, you meet unhappy people in the world <coughs> and they've allowed whatever it is that's causing them pain in the world to overtake them and it's become them. They've allowed it to de define them. And it's not to say it's an easy thing to step outside that thing because it can dominate your life, but it, it, it's an aspiration. So when metta meets suffering, what arises in his compassion, an active desire to do what we can to alleviate suffering, but we're not to take on somebody else's suffering. So mudita, Sympathetic joy, or joy in the joy of others. 
Traditionally, may your happiness and good fortune not leave you. Well, that's, that's fine, that's good. It says what it, what it needs to say. But there's two sides to, to mudita. There's the, the traditional one, which I think is where I came across it first, was the idea that somebody you know has got that job you always wanted or they've got some piece of good fortune like winning the lottery and you've got to try to somehow grin and bear it and smile and develop that sense of actually being pleased for them. And that's Mudita is very good for that because it, it allows you to see that judging mind, that comparing mind, that discriminating and demeaning sense of envy. And that's very important to see what our response is in that situation. But there's also a sense of actually investigating our own good fortune. We're very lucky we're sitting here with courtesy of Zoom and we're able to sit in a Dharma meeting. We're, we have enough space in our life to practice meditation. Most of us are basically healthy. The sun's shining. There is, you know, so it's worth acknowledging our own good fortune. And out of that fortune, we can see a sense of gladness for being alive. Some recent gladness has disappeared out of common parlance. But it's a wonderful thing, you know, to actually wake up in the morning and to be glad I'm alive. Not surprised, glad. So it's this idea of actually acknowledging our good fortune. And, you know, when we do it to the other people like a friend, well, we might know what our good fortune is. When we're doing it to the neutral person, we probably don't know what the good fortune is, but we know that they're at least able to go about in the world, otherwise we wouldn't know who that neutral person is. So they have some basic good fortune. And the really lovely thing is you make the wish for that good fortune to continue. So it's, it's a really sort of positive uh, state to engage with personally, and also as a sense of seeing how you relate to those in the world. The cultivation of the mind delivering gladness, mudita, is supported by developing the supporting qualities of gratitude. You know, delight. There's another word we don't talk use enough. Meta, universal friendliness and compassion. So you can see it's a development of the previous two practices we've just done. All of these qualities have their origin in our basic goodness. So we could say our Buddha nature, it really depends what your cultural uh, point of view is, where you come from. And the fourth of these, is Upeka. Equanimity is a balanced engagement with all aspects of life. It's not a withdrawal or stepping back. We aim to understand there's not only one correct way to behave. I jokingly tell my class that there'd be a lot less suffering in my life if everybody did what I think is the right thing to do. You know, but the truth is there's multiple ways for people to live life and we can all work together. We aim to act with the best intentions we can find within us, and at times we may receive praise, indifference, and even blame in response to a single action. But, you know, as long as we're coming from a good, the, uh, the intention is good, we can't be responsible for how anybody else receives what we try to do. And after this, we aim to develop the confidence of being unafraid to act that comes from not always being right, 
but comes from not fearing to be wrong. How often do we not do something just in case it's the wrong thing to do? And then we realize, I really should have done that. And the time is gone. So the traditional saying is, may we all accept things as they are. That's not equanimity. If you see something that is wrong and you have the capability to intervene in some way and improve the situation, that's still equanimity. You know, we don't just accept things as they are. And my preference for the saying for equanimity is, I wish myself contentment, but I know that a contentment is dependent on the choices that are made. And I make the wish for me to be able to respond to their often unexpected outcomes with equanimity. A quote, the Scottish poet Robert Burns, who as a wonderful saying, the best laid plans of mice and men gan a glee. A glee means go astray. And that's happened so often to us, but can we respond to those with equanimity? Equanimity is a combination of the other three the metta, the karuna, the mudita. It's not cold and detached, but it's rather a warmth, a generosity that combines with a realistic worldview. In a sense, this brings us full circle, as the danger of developing equanimity is we become too detached from the world. So we have to go back into the cycle of meta. So that's my overview. I'll just check that I've not missed anything from this. What I want us to do now is to, is to practice the divine abridings towards ourselves. And I'm going to take you through this practice and we're going to share it with the group and then we're going to share it out into the world. So if you want to get yourself comfortable and somewhere to do this. Now if you remember where I started this story from I reckon you need to have a calm mind. Now you might all be really good samatha meditators and you're living, walking in the world with perfect mindfulness at the moment. But just bear with me. I'd like us to go through this as I would teach it to my students. And in actual fact, we're doing a world premiere today because I've not done this with what I'm about to do with you, with a group before. So you're my little, you're, you're here doing something which I've never led through before with a group. So what we're going to do is we're going to, once we've all got comfortable, we're going to do something to calm our mind. I would recommend you do some counting, the nine and the six, which we'll do for about five or ten minutes. And then we're going to go through, and I will take you through, the divine abidings practice um, and give you lots of instructions as we go along. And uh, we'll just see what happens and then we can have a chat at the end and see if anybody's got any feedback, questions for me. And we'll just see what happens. Okay. In the words of Watch With Mother, if you're sitting comfortably, we will begin. So just make sure you're sitting comfortably. And just connect with your breath, that literally that life-giving force. And just start your better practice with some care which we'll do for a few minutes.
So finish your med your samatha practice. And allow the breath to find its own lens. So you're not controlling the lens of the breath, you breathe. And I want to focus your attention on your heart region and the center of your breast bone. And I want you to breathe through that area. It's useful to have an outlight awareness in breath, but if it fades as we go through the practice, don't worry about it. So breathe in meta towards yourself. That sense of warmth, of kindliness, that generosity and of acceptance of yourself. And should this be the first time you've practiced metta, as I said at this talk, bring to mind what arises for you when you think, bring to mind a good friend and wish yourself the same qualities. So breathing in that sense of metta, generosity, kindliness. Just connecting with the heart region. This is a nurturing breath. Which allows us to be present with the heart. As you breathe in, you might have a sensation of warmth or opening or whatever, or just connecting. If something arises, just note. If nothing arises, just note. It's not special. So we're going to go through a meta practice towards ourselves. And I'm going to say some phrases and there'll be a Camp while well, you allow them to sit in, sit and resonate with you. And if you want to repeat them in any anything that comes to you in the gaps, then that's fine. Make the wish to yourself. May I live without fear. May I live without fear. So you focus in on the heart region, with the breath and the words. May I have mental contentment. May I have mental contentment. May I have physical contentment. May I have physical contentment. May I have ease of well-being. May I have ease of well-being. Just keep breathing in that sense of matter. Now we're going to practice karuna, compassion towards ourselves. May I be able to be with my suffering, recognizing when to reach out for support and aid. May 
May I be able to be with my sovereign, recognize him when to reach out for support need. May I have the strength and insight not to allow my suffering to define me. May I have the strength and insight not to allow my suffering to define me. So we're just breathing in that corona towards us. The meta is not showing the compassion is caring and wanting the best for us. So we're going to practice Mudita, sympathetic joy towards ourselves. And we want to think before we start this practice of what the good fortune that you have in your life. And the gladness that comes to mind when you think of that good fortune. May I acknowledge my good fortune and the rising of gladness for that good fortune and make the wish that it may continue. May I acknowledge my good fortune and the arising of gladness through that acknowledgement and make the wish that it may continue. So we're going to go on and practice the equanimity. I wish for myself contentment, but I know that the contentment is dependent on the choices that are made. And I wish to be able to respond to the often unexpected outcomes with equanimity. I wish myself contentment, but I know that contentment is dependent on the choices that are made. I wish to be able to respond to the often unexpected outcomes with equanimity. So we wish Meta Runata, Mudita, Nekpeka, towards ourselves. Now I want us to share uh, those divine abidings with everybody in this meeting. So you are going to make the wish towards all the people in this group, but also be aware that all the people in the group are making that wish towards you. So it's very much a two-way process. May all the people gathered in this Sangha, this group, be free from fear. May all the people who gathered in this group be free from fear.
may they have then token them. May they have mental contentment. May we all have mental contentment. Always remember to include yourself in the group. So may we all have physical contentment. May we all have physical contentment. May we have ease of well-being. May we have ease of well-being. So we share better within this group that's gathered. May we all be able to be with our suffering, recognising when to reach out for support and aid. May we all be able to be with our suffering, recognising when to reach out for support and aid. May we all have the strength and insight not to allow our suffering to define us. May we all have the strength and insight not to allow our suffering to define us. So if we make the wish for us all to be touched by Karuna. May we all celebrate each other's good fortune and make the wish that it may continue. May we all celebrate our good, may we all celebrate the good fortune that we all have in this group and make the wish for it to continue. So making the wish for wooded sympathetic joy. I wish all of us contentment but we know that that contentment is dependent on the choices that are made. And I make the wish that you are able to respond to the often unexpected outcomes with equanimity. I wish all in this group contentment, but I know that contentment is dependent on the choices that are made. And the wish is that we will all be able to respond to those unexpected outcomes with equanimity. So we sh we're, we're sharing these divine abidings. As I said, the divine abidings are immeasurable. We're going to allow these divine abidings to move outwards. Traditionally, from ourselves in the six directions, in front, to the right, to the left, to the behind, to the left, the up and down. We just allow that, that wish for the divine abidings to outwards. It's not, as we've discovered, constricted by physical bias. It's very impulse is to go out and be shared. So we're going to make the wish for these divine abidings to be shared amongst all sentient beings. May all sentient beings be free from fear. 
we all sentient beings of mental contentment may they all of physical contentment may they have ease of well-being may they be able to be with their suffering recognizing when to reach out for support and aid have the strength and insight not to allow their suffering to define them. We celebrate their good fortune and make the wish that it may continue. I wish, we wish that all beings contentment, but know their contentment is dependent on the choices that are made. And we wish that they'll be able to respond to the often expected outcomes with equanimity. So we want to let go of our personal experience of divine bindings and share it with all beings out into the world. Just imagine it spreading north, south, east, west, up, down, left, right, front, just without limit. And we're going to share it with all beings, without selection, without discrimination. Just allow the wish for the divine abidance to be shared, to go out in the world, to touch who it will, without selection, without discrimination. Just let go of it. It's no longer you blessing of the divine abidance, it's just divine abidance going out into the world. Once you've let go of it, come back in your body. Let go of the breath and let it fade into the background where it lives the last moment of the time. And sit for a few minutes and just reflect on the practice that you've done. And when you're ready, finish the practice by opening your eyes and coming back into the meeting. Any, any questions, comments, any feedback, whatever you may like to ask? Veronica. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much um, for both things, you know, the, uh, the sort of interpretation, particularly making those divine abidings more related to our kind of real experience. Um, I think I found the same as you in some ways that the words are quite powerful, the original, but you have to, when you said at the beginning, you know, it didn't sort of awaken your heart. Um, I was glad about you said that because I sometimes felt that as well. Though I was always very aware of the intense power of of Metta and the others. So that was really reassuring in a way. And um, and finding ways of expressing those uh, viharas, you know, uh, in relation to, as I say, into real experience being without fear very very helpful and sometimes you need the go ahead <laughs> to use your own words but one thing that came up for me just stuck a little bit was the um by your own choice your contentment it, there's a sort of bit added there um to, to to maybe glad not glad glad for my contentment but be aware that my contentment is kind of the result of my choices um and I think that's that's very important. And then, and then uh, there's a chant we do, the four divine abidings. And um, I can't find my chanting book right now. I didn't. It, it's in another place. But I'm sure in that um, I've often wondered why as well in the four divine abidings in the chanting book in the chant, the very last one under equanimity is a lot of phrases about karma. I am heir to my own karma, I'm the result of my own karma, you know, my karma is inevitable or something like that. It's sort of a reminder really that these states are not 
you know, um, gently aroused in a way, they are actually the result, you know, of, um, well, I suppose of sealer of all good, you know, good intention. So, so I felt that was, that was important as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the bit I, I read, which talked about the old age sickness and death, the passage then goes on to talk to about how this is very much related to karma, you know, that yeah. this is how, you know, we, we arrive because of karma and we go out to wherever we go because of the karma we create, but we, we can only work with the, 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 the intention we have in this in embodiment. Yeah. So it is all very much related to karma. Karma and equanimity made me realize how close they are combined. You know, it might be uneasy at times that, because in a way there's a sense of responsibility there. But um, th th I felt that was very important. And before I pass on, can I just uh, make a little advert <laughs> to say these Saturday morning talks will be continuing right through the summer. Uh, there's lots of good surprises there. They're, they're being planned at the moment. Roberta might be able to say a little bit more, perhaps at the end. I just wanted my chance while I'd got it to say that. And so you've set us off to a really good start. Um, Thank you. And, um, you know, it, 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 it gives us a good sense of what's coming ahead. So thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you. Nicola? Yes, um, I just want to add um, with what's just been said about the equanimity. I've just found the passage and I thought I would just read it that Veronica mentioned and just say also that I felt that as well, that, that um, Alan's um, connection with equanimity and the, um, those, those karma, the, the karma words uh, really resonated with me. So in the uh, spreading of the Brahma Vihara's chant, um, all beings are owners of their own karma, heirs of their own karma, born of their karma, kin to their karma, have karma as a refuge, whatever karma they do, whether good or bad, to that they will be heirs. Thank you. Um, I found really resonated as well was um, that you mentioned um, and I found it really just really useful as a guide really um, that suffering is our guide um, to work towards our own progression our heart progression and and you know towards enlightenment I found that a very useful um, take on the journey that we all make as as human beings through our lives so thank you oh, thank you <laughs> yes um that reminds me um also of something very powerful um that my booman said once on, on a retreat about dukkha um say thank you to your dukkha there's no sukkha without dukkha. So don't reject it. And it's quite interesting when there is dukkha and you do that, how it changes. It just seems to dissipate or soften or something. That's always stayed with me. Um, and it's something I try to go to in my most challenging moments. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, because we we almost we uh, when dukkha arises, that's being personally, we do tend to sort of at best distance ourselves and, and more often not actually push it away, which is mm -hmm. it adds another layer to it, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It, yes, it just nurtures it and develops it and increases it. And, gets involved in it. Mm. I'm very in, I'm very curious because I say I've not done this with groups before as to how people found 
going through the the whole four divine abidings in a single practice. So I, I'm going to be cheeky and ask for feedback because it's only way I know how people. It's what I do in my class. So I'm going to treat you as a little bit like my class. <laughs> Sabrina, you need to turn your uh, microphone on. Yes, yes. I um, I just wanted to thank you because it's all really useful and uh, just try to make um, meaningful for yourself uh, uh, things to help you with the everyday life. And when you were going through the fourth interpretation, when we got to the joy one, uh, and um, we were saying, may I celebrate with the you your good fortune and make the wish that it may continue a, a bell rang into me like a untuned bell because it made me because intention is uh, for me at the moment the the answer to um, get on with life uh, and with my fears and, and i just thought uh, when you make a wish is it an act of will that you're doing are you trying to push things or you are just declaring your intention and because for me, intention is more related to what you feel with your heart. What if you wish something is your mind, which is pushing somehow. So that's the only thing that I, uh, I, I yes, to me sounded like it made me think, which is a good thing. <sighs> yeah, this, 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 this is the real curiosity that all words have individual meanings. You know, this is why it's quite often safer to talk about meta rather than loving kindness or universal friendliness. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm not sure personally I'd make quite a strong distinction between wish and intention, but I understand exactly where you're coming from. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, one of the most difficult things in the world to do is to write a message to a group of people and hope that they'll all read it the same way. Oh no, but then maybe just that they find what they need in the <laughs> message that you are. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you anyway. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I like doing all four in one practice. I thought that was very good and um, I've often taught it myself all four in one practice so yeah if that's my feedback on that well thank you Rachel. yeah just to, yeah okay. just um yeah I, I agree with that but I, I enjoyed um going through all the four of them because it feels um it feels then you feel the connectedness between them I think and the um I think for me that's really helpful thinking of it thinking that you can build on it like that I think mm -hmm. thank you that's it's good to it's good to hear what you what resonates with you I really it also really resonated the um about the the way you talk about um being able to be with your suffering or um, other suffering but kind of as much as you can <laughs> bear and that the and I think um, so for me that's part of the progression because if you have been giving meta to yourself <laughs> then you're more mindful of where those lines are I think about so I think for me that's always been the fear about being overwhelmed with mm. others suffering and a kind of tendency to close down and, and walk away from it. Yeah, it's, it's a perfectly normal human response, but you know, we sometimes we think we should do more than we we're actually capable of, and, and that causes us suffering. So we have to protect ourselves. It's, it's hugely important. Mm -hmm. But you know, in the balance there, and I'm sure it's it's, it's understated, but. Uh, you know, the idea is that next time we'll maybe just start go a little bit further and grow in it. Yeah, just to say, I, I, I enjoy, after many years of practice myself, I enjoy that very much, very, very much a fresh, a fresh take, you know. <laughs> Sometimes you can be too long doing, doing the same thing. And I know I, I found in 
Sam, you know, there's a big, the big emphasis on, on meta, and for me there was from the start, and I never found that difficult particularly, but the, the corona, the others, you know, is just, just broadening them and expanding them, and I think definitely for me personally, I think working myself with, with corona, uh, you know, that, that um, just having compassion for yourself, um, for, for your own suffering, and then that, that helps you with others and as Veronica said you know that all, all other people you know they are we are all heirs to our own karma you know so uh, you can't ever you know just accepting that other people even people close to you their their suffering is it's just what they have to endure you know uh, so uh, yeah no very very much enjoyed it this morning thank you yeah I mean th these are my words there's, there's no nothing sacrosanct about my words that's my words you know and uh, that makes the connection with me I, not dates for me to give you permission but I, I think it is sometimes worth if you're working with these things looking to see what actually makes sense for you um hi i just wanted to say um I found the practice very um, quite practical aspirations and quite achievable and doing them all four together is kind of like a well-rounded toolkit to kind of approach life with and also the, the way in which you've um, kind of tailored them. My friend she's just lost her mum and she's really lost and um, struggling and I'm trying to support her but without being too Buddhist because she's not Buddhist. <laughs> so I've written her a card and I've put be well, be happy. And, and for someone who's not familiar, it doesn't really mean anything. Mm -hmm. So I think if you could share your, your terminology, it's a bit more practical guidance, isn't it? Without these airy fairy, not airy fairy, but without being familiar, you can kind of read them and take a lot from them rather than read them and wondering what the hell they mean. Yeah. That's really helpful. But, personal guidance and for supporting other people as well. It's practical thanks. Yeah. I don't know if there's some way I can share these slides with people, but um, I'm sure there must be if, if people would like that. Yeah. But it's lovely to hear you find it interesting. Useful. Alan, I I just like to say as well. I really like the way you talked about equanimity, and I think it because it is so important to get across that it's not about this cold indifference and a kind of just a withdrawal from any kind of feeling, and it has to be built on the first three. It is it comes from it, um, and that ability to become quiet enough and centered enough to have a kind of even gaze over whatever and it might not be sustainable for very long but just I think it's a real goal and it for me it's it defines the middle way you know mm -hmm. so and I think that's what that means and um, so yeah I, I was really glad you emphasized that about it not being to do with cold indifference you know yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that that was the, the phrase that when I picked it up from Sharon Salzberg about ease of well being, which is really very much about equanimity, because it really was the idea of just being able to, you know, engage, but you know, in but without stickiness, I suppose. <laughs> well thank you, Alan. Thank you very much indeed for uh, for a very enjoyable talk and practice. Um, I'm just gonna...